Hello everyone, this is a big lecture on signal, signal processors, everything you want to know about digital signal processing. We're going to start with equalization or EQ. Equalization really is about controlling your signal, making it sound good in the mix, understanding what you recorded, and working with it after you record it in order to make it sound good. Um, so you can control the amplitude of the signal, the harmonics of the signal, you can control one instrument or groups of instruments, and the reason blending tracks together is a big one, correcting or um, or perfecting microphone, the sounds coming in from the mic into the mix, um, correcting any problems, increase the track separation so you can hear everything, and also to alter the original sound. So here's a mixer. Here's in the mix window in Pro Tools, this is the EQ module. And you can see all these different choices. Here we have anything above zero would be boosted and anything below zero would be dipped. So we have um, a lot of different choices here. Right now, you, you can see they're color coded. There's, a, there's filters that we're going to learn in this lesson on how to use this module. Let's start with peaking. So the bandwidths further away from the center are less effective. When you take an EQ and you use a peaking filter, you can peak or dip frequencies. So the most affected is right here in the center. And as you go away, those are affected less by that filter. So this curve right here, this part of the sine wave is called the bandwidth. And the bandwidth are the frequencies that are minus 3 decibels from the peak of the curve around the center frequency. So the center frequency is right around the middle. 3 decibels from either side. If I colored this space in, it would be the bandwidth. Q, and you see that on a lot of mixers, is the inverse measure of the bandwidth. So it's the frequency center, whatever that frequency is, over the bandwidth. I gave you a sample here um, of a calculation of Q. 800 hertz over 200 hertz equals 4. That explains why Q is an easier number to use on a mixer. So if you want to know what the Q is, it, uh, of 800 hertz center frequency with 200 hertz on either side, it's 4. Shelving filters, I use these a lot. With shelving filters, you can boost or dip frequencies, and then you have a cutoff frequency. So these are great for things like cymbals, bass, bass notes, things like that. Things where you want to raise or dip an entire range of frequencies. High and low pass filters are here. High pass means the high frequencies are going to pass through and you're going to be accentuating the lows. You'll see that also on low instruments. Notice you can't raise anything. It's just a high pass filter. The low pass the same things. You're going to let the low frequencies go through. And so you use this on things like symbols. Um, you can see right here there's a cent frequency center. And again, the minus 3 decibels, just like the other filters. Um, and I'll correct my PowerPoint while I'm here. <laughs> um, so the pass band, the frequencies are attenuated by by less than three decibels. So if you go down three decibels, if you color in this box, this is what you're mostly affecting. Cut off frequency, three decibels below the peak. And the slope of the filter, the rate of increasing attenuation per octave. You can, a lot of softwares, you can affect that slope. So there are simple frequencies. You can only really drag these left or right on how, what's the cutoff frequency. You cannot boost or dip the high and low pass filter. Here's another good diagram of cutoff frequency. So again, three decibels below the peak is cutoff frequency. Here's a bandpass filter. What it is is a high pass and a low pass together, and what you have left are the middle frequencies. You want to hear something that sounds like AM radio, where you just get the center frequencies and not all the highs and lows. You can make a bandpass filter. So let's look at what some of those look like and sound like in Pro Tools. So in Pro Tools, 
we let's listen to a drum track. I've got one soloed up here, kick drum track. I'm going to look at the mix window, window mix. And in my inserts, I just go to plugin EQ, EQ seven band. In most plugins, there are libraries. And the same with Pro Tools, or Pro Tools first. I went to Kick Drum and I picked Massive Kick. Let's pick Punchy Kick too. All right. So I can see, I can make this, you can hear the difference here. I can take out the lows. So these greatly affect the mix. So usually what it's good to do, especially when you're newer at this, is start with a library and then Go ahead and change it from there to make it sound how you want. I think I'm going to start with punchy kick. So I've got basically increasing lows here on the the low frequencies all the way up to about looks like about 400 hertz. And my output is peaking, so let me just turn that down a little bit. All right, I got a strong signal, but I don't want it to go in the red. Okay. I could also, I can bypass this um, and then I can listen to it with and without the EQ. So there's always a bypass button in these and there's always a shortcut for that. So I can listen to it without and with this. And what you also want to do, in case I didn't do it, is solo. I did do that. Solo this track so that that's the track that you're listening to when you mix it. Then you want to unsolo it and listen to the whole mix. And that, so I'll go over some of these other things in the EQ module as long as I've got this open. So we have a high pass filter. If I turn that, let me um, go back to zero on the, all of the rest of this. And uh, all right. So if I used a high pass filter and started turning that up, there we go. High pass filter looks like that. Turn that off. A low pass filter. It goes on the other side, so now I can affect the low frequencies. There we go. And then we have um, low frequencies, low mids, mids, highs, and high frequencies. So basically you can booster dip all of these different areas. You can use a circle or just move the dots around or the libraries. We also have a phase button so you can inverse the phase of a frequency coming in. For example, if you mic the top of the drum and the bottom of the drum you're going to want to use that button. I usually use the bottom so that it doesn't cancel out the signal from the top. So again, use the factory defaults to get used to how to work with different fre frequencies. Let's do one more as long as we're here. And we'll do, let's see, let me play this mix, lower it a little bit. And then let's do, um, how about a vocal? Okay, so I have the vocal going. And I can also add it here on this window. I'll go ahead and add EQ to my vocal. Again, I can look at the factory default if I want. Vocals. Let's do male vocal. I like to go, what I, what I usually do is sweep so I I move, um, I move the filter all the way up to hear where the vocal is really strong, then listen to it as I sweep, and then I kind of know what I want to, which area I want to accentuate. So let's. I'm just the way that you yet you're beautiful So that's another example of EQ. 
There are different types of equalization. I have here a 1202 Mac e-mixer just to demonstrate that. Um, selectable frequencies. So on um, these mixers you have those. There is a knob here with um, a high EQ of 12,000 hertz or 12k, 12 kilohertz. So in this selectable frequency you can boost or dip 12 kilohertz and there's some kind of bandwidth around there so it's probably going to affect anything from 10 to 14 kilohertz. But it's a selectable frequency. You can't change anything. It has the number. It has a bandwidth already set. Parametric equalizers, like you just saw in Pro Tools, you can change the center frequency, the bandwidth, the bandwidth, and the amplitude. Let's look at that again. So we can recall that. If we go back and look at one of those EQs. There we go. So center frequency, we can change the center anywhere we want the center to be boost or dip and we can change the bandwidth how many frequencies are affected so parametric EQ is the most used in recording software because you do have all of those choices and you can use more than one filter you can use as many as you want on a single track then you have graphic equalizers. These are used a lot in um, live mixing, especially to, and actually on my live mixer I use it where I have, it looks kind of like a smiley face, so I accentuate the lows and I have the mids at center and I accentuate the highs. But it used, it booster cut the frequencies at the interval set on your device. So for example, maybe you have a hum in your room or some noise, you can, if you isolate it and figure out which one it is, you can take that one down. If you're just making, it's usually called a smiley face, just kind of sweetening the sound, make it the lows and highs a little accentuated. So that is a graphic equalizer, preset intervals. On this PowerPoint that you can download, I put ballpark settings, and it really helped me a lot when I started mixing. Um, not just when I started, but all the time I can refer to different instruments and see uh, what, uh, what some of the reference numbers are for mixing and where to listen to those and then whether I want to boost or dip those. So saxophones a great example. Saxophones are usually warm in the mid ranges, harsh um, in the, around 3000 kilohertz and then you get key noise which is above 10,000 kilohertz. So it's good to know that when you're mixing. There's some more um, some more ballpark settings. We have um, bass, electric guitar, drums, bass of course being really deep you're going to be looking at things that are below 200 hertz for the deep, the deep bass is below 100 hertz. And one more, the voice, which is uh, what you're probably going to spend the most time on, where you want to make sure you understand where the, the sweet range of your male or female, female voice is. If, it, if you have any nasally sounds, those are frequencies that you would dip and where you would and you might dip if you have a lot of S sounds. If you don't have a pop filter, that would be prevalent in there. And um, you'd want to dip that as well. I put this slide in here. These are the four bands of the audio spectrum, and you'll see the equalizers are built to cover these areas, low, low mids, high mids, and highs. Most of your instruments and all your vocals will be in the low mid range as well. Then when you get into high instruments or cymbals, flutes, things like that, those are high mids and highs. This is an instrument frequency chart. You can also download it. This one is from music software download.net and it gives you all of the interesting things in different things that you would record. So let's look at vocals. 100 to 250 adds more vocals up front so it's not buried in the mix. 250 to 800 says muddiness zone so you have to um, you want to be careful with that. 1 to 6k adds presence where you want a little boost to add some brightness. Sibilance clarity between 6 and 8 kilohertz and 8 to 12 kilohertz add bright, adds brightness. So all of those areas you can listen to and adjust with EQ. These are the effects of the audio band. The low boost adds a sense of punch or power. The low mids is where your ear is most sensitive so be careful don't boost all of those and don't boost instruments the same. For example, if you have two guitars, move the center frequencies away from each other so that you can hear them both. Do not over 
move the amplitude too high because that's going to cause ear fatigue. High mids adds a sense of clarity and definition, especially for speaking, so you need a little bump of maybe three decibels at the two to four kilohertz range. And then the high instrument harmonics, sparkle and brilliance, um, those are for things like cymbals, of course. But don't add too much or it becomes harsh. Metering is really important. When you add EQ, or in fact any of these things that you add, it adds volume. And so once you add or boost frequencies, you need to go back and look at any of your meters and make sure they're not going into the red. Once they do, you're going to start recording square waves and noise, and that is no good. And you'll hear, you may hear some clicking in your, when you bounce your tracks, that's from the noise that you're recording. Um, and so You'll see these VU meters on mixers, and you'll see the digital indicators um, like we saw in Pro Tools a minute ago, where you'll have all these digital meters moving. So make sure that things aren't going red. You'll see them in each track as well. So when you boost everything too high, you, have, you might have to turn down your, your output somewhere in order to compensate for that. Okay, so um, the reference level of a VU meter is usually plus 4 dBU, and the standard output le level is about 10 meters, 10 decibels above your reference. What you want to do is when you're recording and listening, it should be around zero and not above that. You have a little headroom, and that um, you want to allow for your headroom in case you have a really loud sound that comes in. So now let's talk about compressors. Compressors are like an automatic fader, so it's like if you had somebody that was operating your fader up and down depending on how loud or soft a signal was, and it basically does it automatically by the way that you set your compressor levels. And it's used to proportionally reduce the dynamic range of a signal that rises above the threshold. This should be above the threshold. Threshold. Above the threshold. So it matches the dynamics of the other recorded tracks. In other words, you wouldn't want one completely sticking out. Um, it's used to lower the volumes of the loudest tracks. And once you do that and you control your dynamic range of a track, you can actually boost the entire volume of the track. I'll demonstrate that in a minute. Here's the different settings. The input gain boosts the incoming signal or lowers it. It's how much signal is being sent to the compressor. The threshold determines how much level above the threshold that the signal can um, can go through. Let me just read this because that was not a good sentence. It determines the level at which the compressor will proportionally reduce the input signal level. And this is easier to understand by showing you, which I'll do in a minute, but let's continue going through the settings. There we go. The output gain, how much signal is sent to the device's output and the ratio, the amount of compression on the signal, signal over the threshold. And there are um, kind of some standard ratios that you'll learn. The ratio of four to one, for example, one decibel increase for in the output for every four decibel increase in the input. So four to one and three to one is the ratio usually set for vocals, for example. And then two more settings, um, the attack, how fast or slow the device will turn down signals that exceed the threshold, and release determines how fast or slow the device will restore a signal to its original level once it's fallen below the threshold. There's a lot of words there, so let's just look at this. We can use the kick drum again. Um, I think that, that would be, uh, we can use the vocal. So let's go ahead and... There's a kind of a loud part here. Let me play that. I'm going to plug in dynamics compressor. Okay. Here's my input and output. This other one here is the amount of signal being compressed based on my settings. So I have the knee is just uh, how sharp the compression happens. The attack. Um, I usually use about 10 milliseconds for vocals. Ratio 3 to 1, that's good for vocals. And release, how fast it goes back to normal. 
the big number here is the threshold, how much compression we're getting on the highest peaks of the vocal. So let's play with that and see what it looks like. So if I have the threshold all the way to minus 60 decibel, I'm over compressing. If I have it off, I get no compression. Let me just turn it up until I get minus 6 decibels on the loudest stuff. So once you set your attack and release and your ratio, it's all about the threshold to if you want to reduce those peaks. It's really handy so that things don't just stick out in the mix. Like when if someone plays a snare drum inconsistently and some are louder than the other, this will fix it. So that's how a compressor works. In fact, probably have the snare drum on here that we can look at. See floor, kick, rack, 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 snare. Okay, let's look at this one. Solo this. There we go. And let me put an input and put a dynamic compressor. All right. So now I have ratio. I can make this one a little higher because drums. I'm going to get four to one. And now let me move my threshold a little bit. There we go. I can make it louder if I want. When I do that, I need to turn the compressor down a little bit. There we go. So now I got it to be too loud sometimes. There we go. Turn the compressor down a little bit. It's going to even out those snare drums. That. In fact, if I did that, first what I should have done is have an EQ on it. And then I'll go back and look at my compressor and see what happened there. I can turn the threshold down a little bit more. So that's how to use um, EQ and compression on a track. This one will take some practice, but once you get it, it's really fun and it works great. So be careful when you use compression. It's very powerful. You can see how it really changes the volume. You have to go back and adjust that. Multiband compressors are great from, for splitting up um, compression over different frequencies. So you can see, you know, when there's a snare drum, you have the drum and you've got the hit of this of the drumstick. So there's usually more than one frequency you're looking at. Do not over compress. Um, it's if you over compress, it sounds like it, everything is muted and compression, all of those settings work together. So make sure you look up how to do ratio settings um, and the attack and release so that the compressor turns on and off uh, quickly with the um, recording of the instrument. Now limiting is basically another compressor, but it usually, usually use it to limit something to a speaker or limit an entire mix and use it on a master track. On those, you use very high ratios, um, so it just prevents some of the highest peaks from reaching full amplitude, um, and it's just it's a hard limit. It won't let anything go beyond a certain point. And they look the same as compressors, so if I used a limiter, so it should be under dynamics, compressor limiter, actually in, in Pro Tools, it's the same plugin, and but I'm gonna change the ratio to something much bigger, 12 to 1. And then it won't be, most of the time it won't be working unless I hit a peak that's just louder than the whole rest of the mix. Expansion, um, it basically, um, the dynamic range of a signal is increased so that um, if, if uh, the gain of the signal goes below the threshold, it's increased. 
Um, it's something that's used less than the compressor and the limiter, but it's in there. Uh, but what it does is if you have some low signals, so maybe, again, a good one might be with um, a drum or a hand drum where you have some lower hits that you would like to make louder. This will do that same thing. It could be used as a noise reducer so that if you have a noise that's below a certain threshold, you just don't, just doesn't play. And it's, again, part of the compressor family. So if I use expansion, should be here, expander, look, should look about the same, yes. So if I use this on that, let me um, mute these other ones here. So I think it would be, this is good for me to remember. Yeah, it's control, control button, we'll turn those off. Turn that one on. All right, let's see what happens here with, all right, the snare drum. I can look at a factory default and look at a snare expander. Depending on where I set the threshold, you can really control that anything coming from that snare. If I look at um, snare gate, now you're just hitting the, you're hearing the hit of the snare and not all the extra rattling. If that's really fun to use with reverb that I'm going to show you in a minute, but let's just do it now. So you can make some crispy sounding snare drums that way. Noise gate is another kind of expansion. It allows the signal above the threshold to pass through without dynamic processing. So it's basically like an infinite expander. Um, sometimes you get page turns, um, buzzing from an instrument, um, something with the keys, things like that. So you can um, you can let that pass through this expansion and basically it won't be processed. So um, it's basically, that's why it's called a noise gate. Once the sound reaches that threshold, it just won't play. Now, sign chaining is, um, is, I use it a lot when I'm matching up things like kick and bass. It allows us uh, one track to trigger another. You hear it a lot in hip hop as well. Um, so you can trigger a kick drum to um, a bass to a kick drum, for example, and have them play together. And if you have one sound like a maybe a bass note on a keyboard that's just a whole note, and then you have a kick pattern, the once you put this on, the bass will the bass note, which is just playing a tone, will follow the same pattern that the kick drum is playing. And then another term, LFO, you hear that a lot with, um, with subwoofers, low frequency oscillator. Um, you can use this to gate, gate the kick and get a lower and powerful sound. You add a lot of low frequencies, and that's another plugin that's in there. Okay, a few more things. Controlling dynamics. Um, the way you do it is apply these dynamics to individual tracks, group tracks, group tracks or a master track. And you can use compressors to um, that minimize changes in volume for track with a large dynamic range. Uh, one example I'll give in my studio when I have opera singers, they're singing very low and then very loud, and I want to control that a little bit, so compressors are great for things like that. Smooth out the source to mic distance changes. So, for example, when your drums are close to each other but you need some distinct sounds, you can use the compressor to smooth out those things where their mics are right next to each other. Um, balance the volume changes on an instrument. Another one of those, I'm a clarinet player, so I get some different sounds on my high notes and my low notes, and you can use a compressor to balance those out. Uh, trumpet would be another one where compressors are really important, especially for those high notes. Um, de-esser, that's when you are singing or talking and you get that tss 
extra S sound, you can reduce those bands where the S is happening. Now, I'll tell you, if you're recording in the wind, um, usually there's too much S sound from the wind, and usually you just get a bad recording. So, um, in that case, you can't, um, recording in the wind is just tough. And then the other thing you can do, which you saw, is you can get your signal to be louder in the mix. So I put some a couple slides of ballpark, ballpark compressor settings. These help me a lot. Um, it, and they still do um, when you're mixing with a compressor so that you can get these uh, kind of library numbers and then just work on changing your threshold, dialing that in until you get six decibels, minus six decibels of compression on the high peaks which we saw. And here's some more. And here's um, for a master track, uh, if you're compressing an entire mix, here's the ratio 2 to 1 or the hard limiter on the master track uh, 10 to 1 for just those uh, few times when you might get a sound that's louder or stronger than the other ones in the entire mix. And looking at Pro Tools again, or any there's usually, um, let me go to the mix window because I like to look at it here. So in the mix window, you have all your tracks. And if I go track new, master track, this track is where you can put those limiters on. So you can add another compressor limiter right there, and then this will basically affect all the other tracks. And that's uh, that track is really important. You don't want to go adding all kinds of effects on it, but you're just affecting the overall mix, and that's a perfect place for a limiter.